All right. I tell you, it's incredible what God does. You know, I think that I, I, every week I, I have, you know, a couple of weeks out in advance, the things that I think God wants me to talk about, and I don't always get that right. And so sometimes right in the middle of that, I'll, I'll, I'll come up to a situation and I'm busy and I can't get this done and I can't get that done and it gets later and later in the week and I'm thinking I got to get this sermon ready, I got to, uh, all that. And then it becomes apparent to me that the reason that happens is because God has something else he wants me to say than he thought, than I thought he wanted me to say. And that happened this week. And so, um, and so here's what I think God wants me to talk about today. It is the journey from slavery to freedom. How many of you have ever been enslaved to something, some kind of addiction, some kind of something? I think almost everybody in the house has been enslaved and bondage to something, and those of us who don't think we have been probably still are, <laughs> to something, okay? It might not be an addiction, it might not be a chemical, but, but we're, almost all of us get enslaved to something at one time or another, and we need to make the journey from slavery to freedom, and there's an incredible story about that in the Old Testament book of Exodus. And you know, all those stories in the Old Testament are not just there for history, they're there for us to learn some practical spiritual lessons from. And so today we're going to try to do that from the story of the Exodus, when the people of Israel had gone down into Egypt, and we could talk about why God took them there, and that's another whole sermon on itself. It's incredible. Um, God took them down there. They spent 430 years there, and they became slaves to the Egyptians. And then God, by his outstretched arm and his mighty power, led them out of slavery in Egypt and took them on a journey to freedom in the promised land. But there were lots of things that happened on that journey and some things that we need to consider as we look at our own life when we're trying to journey from slavery into freedom. Let's read Exodus chapter 6, the first part of verse number 6. Moses wrote this incredible verse. God is speaking through Moses and actually to Moses, and he said, Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I got to tell you, you're never going to have a successful journey if you don't realize by starting with the concept that, that God is the Lord. The word Lord there means master, owner, proprietor. He's the boss. If he tells you to make the journey, you got to make the journey. If he tells you which way to go on the journey, you got to go the way he says to go. If you got to face obstacles on the journey and you got to walk smack into those obstacles, you got to walk smack into them because he says so. He is the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and I will free you from being there or from being slaves to them. So what is this journey about? It's about God bringing them out of slavery and making them free. It's about God keeping his promise, and that's what the whole book of Exodus is all about. It contains this remarkable story of God bringing the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and into the freedom of the promised land. God declared that he would do exactly that when he said that to Moses. Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. There is freedom available. It's not cheap, and it's not easy, and it requires some things on our part. They had to make the journey. They had to face the obstacles. They had to do what God wanted them to do in order to get the freedom. Sometimes people think they can just come to, to a place of prayer in a church and ask God to make them free and automatically they ought to be free. No, God requires some things of us in the journey in order to get from slavery to freedom. And that's what we're going to look at today. By studying this incredible story of the Israelites' journey from slavery to freedom, we can learn several practical lessons about the believer's journey from spiritual slavery to freedom in Christ. We know that God wants his people to experience freedom because he has given us a whole book full of truth that is designed to set us free from spiritual enslavement. This whole book, actually a library of 66 books, God has written and preserved it down through the ages so that we have multiple copies available to us today, and it is full of truth. Jesus said to his father, your word is truth. And so it's full of truth. And then, and then another amazing verse, Jesus said to his disciples, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
You see, the devil has lied to us in order to make us slaves of something. And the only way to get free from our enslavement is to learn the truth that exposes the lies that he told us that got us into slavery to begin with. Because you see, whatever we believe, whether it's a truth or whether it's a lie, is going to affect our behavior. And when our behavior is based on a lie, the result of that is that form of behavior becomes bondage. It becomes slavery. It becomes destructive. It becomes something that brings us into captivity to that form of behavior. And so the only way to get free from those abnormal kinds of behavior is to learn the truth that exposes the lie. And that's why if you know the truth, the truth can set you free. So let's learn some lessons from Israel's journey from slavery to freedom. Some practical lessons. Lesson number one, only the Lord can deliver his people from slavery. Get that? You are not big enough, strong enough, smart enough to get yourself out of slavery. Let me ask you this. Let's take a survey. I love surveys. How many of you have been enslaved to something and tried to get out on your own, set yourself free? Let me ask you this. How'd that work out for you? That never works out good, does it? You can't do it. Only the Lord can give us slave or can free us from slavery. God said to the Israelites in Exodus chapter 6, verse number 7, He said, Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. He told Moses to do these ten plagues. And he told Moses, when you do these plagues and the people see it and they see how God breaks the Egyptians through these plagues, then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Do you get that? It was the Lord who brought them out. They didn't bring them out th themselves out. And if you're enslaved to something, you won't be able to get free from that yourself. You're going to have to rely on the Lord to bring you the freedom that comes with knowing Christ and learning His truth. And so that's why, that's why it's important that we recognize that we can't do this on our own. When we try to deliver ourselves from freedom, we can hope for only temporary relief at best. How many of you have ever done that? You said, I'm not doing this anymore. Whether it's a chemical addiction or whether, whatever it is, you, you said, I'm not going to do this anymore. And for maybe a few days or a few weeks, you do okay, only to find yourself right back in that again. Because you don't have the power that it takes to have lasting freedom. You can only hope for temporary relief at best. And you know, and you know, Peter referred to this fact when he wrote this, and he was actually quoting from the Psalms of the Old Testament. He wrote this, A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Do you get that? You don't have the power to break that cycle yourself. Only the Lord can do that. If you're trying to do it on your own, you'll be just like a dog that vomits and then later on comes back to it and ugh, eats it. That's wonderful, isn't it? And you'll be just like a sow. That, and a sow, by the way, is a female pig who, who leaves the wallow in the mire and gets all washed up and cleaned up and she is looking good. Do you realize that the dog is a male and the sow is a female? So he didn't leave anybody out, did he? In spite, in spite of what some confused people say in our generation, you are either male or female and there is no other. Get that? I, just, I won't get into that, but, but look at this. Girls, you can get all cleaned up and look good. You can be styling and profiling and think you got it all under control, but if you're doing it by yourself, you will eventually turn right back to wallowing in the mire. Only temporary relief is what we can hope for if we're trying to do it ourselves. Here's the second lesson. Oh, let me give you another verse, though, on that. Um, when Jesus sets us free, it's not temporary. It doesn't have to be temporary. If we think Jesus has set us free, people go to the altar and say, oh, Jesus set me free. And then six months later, they're back at Freedom House. Jesus didn't set them free. They just thought he did. You get that? Now, look at this. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You get that? If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Lesson two, sometimes God uses other people to force us to begin the journey. Have any of you had that experience? 
God put somebody else in your life that loved you enough, that said, I'm cutting you off right here. I'm not lifting another finger for you. I'm not helping you one. I'm not enabling you one more moment until you make up your mind to get the help that you really need. And they force you to start the journey. Praise God for people like that. And look at this. Look at this. Yeah. Look at this. After God brought his 10th plague on Egypt, which was the death of the firstborn males. The death angel passed over that night. The firstborn in every Egyptian home died. And you know, sometimes we miss that. We think a death in every household. Could have been more than that. Could have, could have been, and it was typical in, in, in that culture, in that day and time, for multi-generational you know, families and multi-generations to live in the same household. There could have been grandpa there who was the firstborn. He died that night. Daddy could have been his firstborn. He died that night. And then daddy's firstborn son died that night. There could have been three deaths in that one household. Talk about the wail of mourning and grief that must have just echoed through the land of Egypt that night when the firstborn in every Egyptian household died. And when God did that, when God did that, <laughs> Pharaoh forced the Israelites to begin their journey from slavery to freedom. It was no longer just something they wanted to do. This is what Moses wrote about that event in Exodus chapter 12, verses 31 to 33, some excerpts here. He wrote, during the night, this is the night when all these firstborn have died, during the night Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people, you and the Israelites, go. <laughs> they didn't have any choice now, did they? They're being forced to begin the journey. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country. Sometimes God knows that the only way we're going to start the journey is if somebody else steps up and forces us to start the journey. And sometimes he's a judge. And sometimes he's a prosecutor. And sometimes he's whoever. But sometimes he does that and he forces the issue. Because God loves you. You can be mad at the judge, you can be mad at the prosecutor if you want to. But God used them to force you to start the journey. You get that? You can be mad at mom and dad if you want to, if they force you to start the journey. You can be mad at your spouse if you want to. You can be mad at your kids if you want to, but somebody needs to force you to start the journey if you ain't got enough gumption to start the journey on your own. Isn't that wonderful? And so God does that for us. God does that for us. And then look, then look at this. It's supposed to work that way. When, when we begin, when we begin to do that, God, God is just showing us how much he loves us. You see, we should expect God to use other people in our lives, shouldn't we? Please don't make the mistake of isolating yourself from other people that he brings into your life, even if you don't like what they're trying to pressure you to do. Don't all isolate yourself from them. Paul wrote this, none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. That's in Romans 14, 7. Do you know what that means? That means we are not at our best when we try to do it alone. God doesn't want any lone ranger Christian cowboys out there trying to do it on their own. Everybody needs somebody. And so, and so he says that here. We, need to, we don't need to isolate ourselves from those people that are trying to force us to do things that we need to do that we don't really want to do. And, and when God created Adam, here's right in the very beginning. When God created Adam, this is what he said about him. It is not good for the man to be alone. So God puts us with other people. God brings other people into our life. Every time a baby is born, that baby is born into a family. It may be a broken, dysfunctional, messed up family, but he puts that baby in a family. Why? Because God knows that we're in our best when we are in relationship with other people. And then God will use those people and even other people of his choosing to force us at times to do the things that are necessary for our own well-being. And so we got to get that. God brought Pharaoh to the throne to force the Israelites to start the journey back to freedom. Now here's another one. Sometimes, this is lesson three, sometimes your journey to freedom will inspire others to make the journey. You get that? So when you journey to freedom, it's not always just about you. 
Sometimes God uses your journey to freedom to inspire others to make that journey. Look at what Moses wrote in Exodus chapter 12, verses 37 to 38. He wrote, the Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, so they have started their journey. This is the first leg of their journey. They have journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, and there were about 600,000 men on foot, besides the women and children. And then look at this. Many other people went up with them. Do you know what that means? That means it wasn't only the Jews who went. There were some non-Israeli people that were inspired by the courage of the Jews and by the power of the God of the Jews to begin their journey that they said, let's get on the bandwagon, let's go too. If God can do it for them, God can do it for us. My friends, sometimes your journey will inspire others to begin their journey to freedom. And we need to be excited when God does that. It's supposed to work that way. When we begin to follow the Lord out of bondage and into freedom, then our lives should inspire others. And when we are on a journey with Jesus, then our light will shine for others to see. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And in this case, in the context we're talking about, when they see you start out on a journey, when they see you stay on the journey, when they see you finish the journey, then what's going to happen? He says that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. They will start doing the things that make the Father in heaven look good. The word glorify there means to make someone look good. Whenever you start your journey and God starts to transform your life, that makes God look good. And whenever other people are inspired to do the same thing because you did it, then that makes God look good. And our goal in life, once we become a believer, should be to do everything we can to glorify the Father, and that just means make Him look good. And i got to tell you, everything you do casts a reflection on the God that you serve. Are you aware of that? You do good, God looks good. You do bad, God looks bad. We need to think about that anytime we're going to make a decision. Lesson number four. Lesson number four. When the journey has been completed, we should never stop celebrating. <laughs> Don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget where you came from. When we finish the journey, when we finally make it to the promised land, when we've arrived at the freedom that Christ has to offer to us then, then we should never stop celebrating what the Lord has done. Moses wrote this. It's in Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 to 42. He wrote, the people of Israel had lived in Egypt for 430 years. In fact, it was on the last day of the 430th year that all the Lord's forces left the land. God's got this time down to the very day, doesn't he? The very last day of that 430th year, they marched out, division by division, like a huge army. On this night, the Lord kept his promise to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. So this night belongs to him, and it must be commemorated. We would say celebrated. It must be commemorated every year by all the Israelites from generation to generation generation. Do you get that? What did he tell them to do from that point on and don't ever stop doing it? As long as there's a nation of Israel with a new generation coming on, what were they supposed to do? Keep celebrating. Every year on that day, set up a celebration, do it every year as a continual reminder of where God brought them from. Listen, I think we don't have near enough celebrations in our personal lives. Oh, we do Christmas and Easter and all that, you know, all those things. We do some of those things. We do birthdays and all that. But I'm going to tell you, when God has done something significant, significant for you in your life and you can recognize God did this and God started this on this day, you need to mark that day on the calendar and you need to celebrate that and celebrate that and celebrate that and celebrate that and for some of you it is it is the day you got saved in fact all of us it ought to be that Amen. all of us it ought to be that I'm telling you I got saved on April the 15th of 1975 and that's income tax day so that's easy for me to remember but every year in April I have my own personal little celebration and I call it my my second birthday, my first birthday is October the 31st. That's another holiday, isn't that wonderful? My first birthday is October the 31st, and that was my physical birth. But then I was born again on April the 15th, 1975, and I celebrate that personally every year because I remember that God brought me from a, 
from, from being a lost 16-year-old boy in the dark, in a terrible environment, without any hope for the future, and all confused about what life was all about. And suddenly God saved me, and he gave me purpose, and he gave me direction, and it has been a wonderful ride, i got to tell you that. Hadn't always been easy. But it's been a great ride, and I, I celebrate that. And there are just things that God does in your life that are significant moments in your life, on your journey. And you need to celebrate. You just need to celebrate. And so they did that. We know, we know that God likes it when his people celebrate what he has done because he has designed baptism. We saw that today, a couple of guys getting baptized. He has designed baptism as a celebration of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. Man, what greater thing could we celebrate than the fact that Jesus lived and died and rose again for us? And now I've believed that and I have eternal life. And so I not only want to celebrate my birthday, my spiritual birthday, but I need to celebrate the day I got baptized. Because, man, that's a celebration. See, he wrote this. Paul wrote this in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. He wrote, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? So baptism is a picture of the death of Christ. Therefore, we are buried with him. That's why we bury people in this tank of water, because it's a burial. And then we are buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, even so, we also should have a new kind of life. Get that? Raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, then we too may live a new life. Isn't that incredible? That's what baptism is. And so we should celebrate. It's a celebration when somebody gets baptized. And so, and so God likes celebrations. He built that into the life of the church. And here's another one. God also designed the Lord's Supper as a celebration of the horrible death that Jesus endured for us. Some people think about the death of Christ on the cross and they think, what a horrible thing. No, it's a wonderful thing. We would be lost and hopeless and doomed to eternity in the lake of fire if Jesus hadn't done that. And God said, celebrate it. And so he built it into the life of the church, this thing called communion or the Lord's Supper as a celebration of what Jesus did for us. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He wants us to celebrate and to continue to celebrate that event until he comes. And that's why he tells us, just keep on doing the Lord's Supper. And I know churches argue about, you do it every week, you do it once a quarter, you do it once a month, you do blah, 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 blah. There's no schedule set in the scripture. We can do it whenever we feel the urge to celebrate, but we ought to keep doing it. We ought to keep doing it. And that's what he says. We need to celebrate that. In the Old Testament, he built seven feasts into the Old Testament system of worship. And every one of those was a celebration of something. God loves celebration. And he wants us to celebrate all the significant things that happen on our journey from slavery to freedom. Here's number five. There is often the temptation to turn back to familiar territory when the journey gets tough. Have you experienced that? If you, the journey gets tough, and there's often the temptation to turn back to familiar territory. I don't know how many people, because the Lord, I guess I'm a little twisted, because the Lord just tends to, 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 tends to bring people into my life and, and, and has kind of given me the ministry of, of just reaching out to and loving really broken people. You know, addicts and alcoholics and all kinds of other folks that most folks don't have much to do with. You realize that. I'm not being ugly, but you realize that most of the modern contemporary church, they're afraid of you. <laughs> they don't know what to do with you. <laughs> you know, we don't want to bash them. God has a ministry for them, but, but God has kind of done this for me and, or to me. I'm not sure how you look at that, but um, he's done this. And, and so here's the thing. The thing is that I've learned, and I don't know how many... I've learned this from people like you. I don't know how many people I've, I've talked to that, that, that start out on the journey and then some difficulty comes along in the journey. It gets hard. The level of drugs in their system gets lower than it's been in months. And what does your body say? That pituitary gland in your brain, what does it say? I need a fix. I need this. And what's the temptation at that moment? 
turn back to the familiar. Stop the journey and turn back. And you know what the Israelites wanted to do every time things got tough? Every time they ran out of food? Every time they ran out of water? Every time they faced an enemy? Do you know what they wanted to do? They wanted to go back to Egypt to the familiarity of slavery. I, we want to do that. We want to turn back on the journey at critical points. And God doesn't want us to turn back. Moses wrote this. It's in Exodus chapter 14, some excerpts from verses 5 down to verse number 12. He wrote, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites. Here's something else about your journey. The devil will be dogging your steps every foot of the way. Pharaoh changed his mind. We can't let all those slaves get away. We're losing our labor force. And they, and they went and they, and they pursued them. They chased after them. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them, and they were terrified. Now put yourself in their place. <clears throat> See, sometimes the journey's scary. How many of you have been afraid at times on your journey? Sometimes the journey's a little scary, right? Put yourself in their place. The, 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 the armies of Egypt, with all their chariots and all their weapons and all that, the dust is rolling up over the horizon as the armies of Pharaoh are approaching them from one direction. And they want to run. And there's the Red Sea. And they're trapped. They're blocked. There's an obstacle in the way. And the armies of Pharaoh are coming up behind them. And it's just a, a scary, scary situation. And when the going got tough, look at what they did. They were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, was it because there were not graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? You know what you do sometimes when the journey gets tough? You blame somebody else for the situation you're in. How many of you played the blame game? Hey, I'm good at it. Yeah, we tend to do that, don't we? We want to blame somebody else for, for the difficulties in, in the journey. And then look, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. What were they saying? We wish we were back in Egypt. We wish we had never left. In their heart, they wanted to turn back on the journey. You can't ever turn back on the journey or you'll never get to freedom. You've got to get that. And here's, here's the, the last lesson. Lesson six. The Lord is bigger than any obstacle we face during the journey. The Lord is bigger than any obstacle. In their case, they had two obstacles at this moment, right? The Egyptian army closing in fast from behind and the Red Sea blocking them from the front. I mean, they were between the proverbial rock and a hard place, weren't they? I mean, they were stuck. But God was bigger than Pharaoh's army and God was bigger than the Red Sea. He's bigger than any obstacle. The Israelites' first obstacle was that Red Sea. But God was bigger and he took care of both obstacles, the sea and the army, in one fell swoop. He brought in a strong east wind and parted the sea and then dried the seabed up so they could go through on dry ground. And then they got through, and the Israelites thought, we can go through too. And then God brought the water crashing down on them and destroyed the entire Israelite army. God was bigger than both obstacles. Look at this. Moses stretched out. This is Exodus 14, verses 21 and 22. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry ground. And then the waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Aren't you glad that God is bigger than your Red Sea, whatever that is today? Whatever the difficulty, whatever the obstacle you face on your journey, God is bigger than that. So my question for you is what Red Sea obstacle are you facing on your journey today? Whatever it is, remember, God is bigger. In fact, Jesus said, get this, with God all things are possible. I doubt that you could have convinced too many people in the Israeli camp that night when the dust was boiling up over the horizon as the Egyptians were coming. I doubt if you had went through the camp, 
If you could be teleported back into time, and you already knew the story, and I doubt if you could have went through the camp and told somebody in each of those tents, look, it's going to be okay, God's going to part the waters of this sea, they would have probably said, it ain't going to happen. That could never happen. It's never happened before, and it ain't going to happen today. God is bigger. But once they got on the other side of that, once they faced that obstacle and God took care of that obstacle... For a few weeks, at least, you probably couldn't have convinced them that there wasn't anything that God couldn't do until they ran into the next obstacle. <laughs> Isn't that the way we are? And then there we are, stuck again in our stinking thinking. So here's the conclusion. God knew that the Israelites would be easily discouraged on the journey. But he didn't want them to turn back to the slavery of Egypt. So after they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground... He blocked the path back to Egypt. He did that for them. Because he knew they would be easily discouraged and want to go back. Notice what the scripture says. This is, this is in Exodus 14, 26 and 27. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak... The sea went back to its place. They couldn't get back. You get that? Sometimes God will, will overcome an obstacle for you, and then he'll put an obstacle behind you. Sometimes he does that, and it's good that he does that. Sometimes you view your parents or your spouse or whoever as an obstacle when they finally say, you cannot live here, I will not help you anymore, this marriage is over unless you get help, unless you get on this journey. They force you to do that. And then God removes some obstacle. And then you look back and you say, wow, I'd like to go, I'd, I'd still like to go back. I want to go back home. But whoever it is that wouldn't let you come home to begin with realizes that you didn't need to go home. You weren't ready to go home yet. And they become an obstacle behind you. They say, nope. You go ahead and turn in your 24 at Freedom House if you want to and you get your bus ticket, but you ain't coming here. I'm praying that God's going to raise up a whole host of families that will do that. I love you all, but don't we need that? Don't we need that, that obstacle behind us sometime to keep us from going back? I, I, what I love about this story is that, that, God, that God took this obstacle that was behind them and he, I mean, that was in front of them and he made it an obstacle behind them. Isn't that amazing? What had been an obstacle in front of them was now an obstacle behind them. God doesn't want you to turn back to the familiar territory on your journey. In fact, Paul wrote this in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. He said, one thing I do. There's a bunch of stuff he says I don't do. But one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead... I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You know what Paul had finally learned by this point in his life? Keep moving forward. Forget what was back there. Oh, never forget what you, where you came from in the sense of glorifying God for where he's brought you to. But all that stuff that would lure you to go back, forget it. Forgetting what was behind, he says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize. You may be thinking, I just can't do it. Have you ever been there? I just can't do it. You say, I was there this morning when I got up. I just can't do it. You know what Paul wrote? Paul wrote this in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13. I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want to give you this. When you get up in the morning or when you're having a bad moment through the day, when you're struggling with some obstacle and you say, I just can't do it, you are in a wonderful spot. Because the simple truth is you can't do it. 
but you know one who can. Did you get that? You can't, but he can. And that's why Paul said, I can do all things through whom? Through Christ who gives me strength. You get that? You can't, but he can. And so we need to direct our attention back to the one who can. 